this is Memorial Stadium in its final season as the home of the Baltimore Orioles. And tonight on Sunday Night Baseball, the Orioles host the Toronto Blue Jays. The news stunned the baseball world. Four-time gold lover Tony Fernandez traded, along with slugger Fred McGriff, to San Diego for Roberto Alomar and Joe Carter. This shortly after George Bell left via free agency to the Chicago Cubs. For manager Cito Gaston's Blue Jays, it marked the start of a new era. Alomar, just 23, is quickly emerging as a true star. He leads the league with 17 doubles. Carter has driven in over 100 runs in four of the last five seasons. Now he's doing it again. He leads the Jays with 10 home runs and 34 runs battered in. In Baltimore, Cal Ripken has continued to carve his niche among baseball's all-time great shortstops. A year ago, he made only three errors, an all-time record. But this year, he's been doing it with the bat. When May ended, he led the league with 12 home runs. Then, in the first week in June, he took over the league lead in batting. And all the while, he has been among the league leaders in RBIs. It's Alomar and the Jays, Ripken and the Orioles next. This is Memorial Stadium on 33rd Street in Baltimore, and tonight ESPN Sunday Night Baseball features the first place Toronto Blue Jays against the Baltimore Orioles. The Boston Red Sox lost earlier today in Oakland, and so they are one game back of the first place Jays as the Jays begin play tonight, and the Orioles, well, they're all the way down there at the bottom of the table. Hello, everyone. I'm John Miller, along with Joe Morgan. We're happy to have you with us. It's a hot night. It's a night for baseball here in Baltimore, and the Toronto Blue Jays are the first-place team in the East. Now, that is not to say that they're playing like a first-place club. They've lost nine of their last 14, even though they won last night, and they've been able to take advantage of the division. They feel like they need another starting pitcher. They've felt that way since spring training, and a name oft mentioned uh, with the Blue Jays is the Montreal Expos' Dennis Martinez. What do you think, Joe? Well, you're talking about one of my favorite pitchers. He's one of the best pitchers in all of Major League Baseball. You put him on a winning team like the Toronto Blue Jays, he can help them win a pennant. The cost will be high, but what is the cost of a pennant? If you can win a pennant with a guy, the cost will not be too high. All right. So far, apparently, they feel like the cost yeah. is too high. A lot of other names have been mentioned as well. One thing that Blue Jays do have right now is a lot of excellent young talent. One guy they won't trade away to anybody is Roberto Alomar, the man they acquired from San Diego. Quite a player. Well, he is quite a player. One of these days, he will be the most viral player in the American League. He can run, he can hit, he can hit with power, he can steal bases, and he plays excellent defense. That adds up to MVP numbers. Now, last night, he stole four bases in the game here in Baltimore. That tied a club record and was his personal record. And at the start of the day, he was just one stolen base behind league leader Luis Polonia. I'm sure we'll see a lot of him tonight. Now, the Orioles are without the big slugger, but which they traded uh, so high to get from Houston, Glenn Davis. He's missed most of the season. Despite that, Cal Ripken has put together MVP-type numbers. He leads the league in hitting at 359 at the start of the day. He's been something else. Well, he's been really something. You don't hear anything about the streak this year that he's too tired to perform. He's too tired to hit. And you don't hear anything about the guys not hitting behind him. So this is just a, a year where he is offensive-minded. Last year he was defensive-minded, only made three errors. But this year he's thinking offense. Well, he's doing it all, and he's been uh, something to see. 25 times he's had two hits or more in a game, three just last night. It's the Orioles and the Blue Jays from Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. The veteran left-handed Jeff Ballardy won 18 a couple of years ago, facing Todd Stottlemyre of the Jays. John Miller and Joe Morgan at Memorial Stadium, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball coming to Baltimore. This is the final season of this old ballpark. Here are the starting uh, lineups. First of all, for the visiting Toronto Blue Jays, Devon White leads off in center field. Roberto Alomar at second base. Joe Carter is the designated hitter batting third. Veteran Pat Tabler is at first base. Ed Sprague, an excellent young rookie at third base. Mark Whitten, another fine young talent, is in right field. Pat Board is the catcher hitting seventh. Manuel Lee is at shortstop. And Glenn Allen Hill, that's ninth in left field. And on the mound for the Orioles, 
The left-handed Jeff Ballard, uh, just the year before last, he was 18 and 8. He's had a hard time uh, getting back to that level, Joe. Well, most of the problems, I believe, is because of his strikes. He has not been throwing quality strikes. He can get the ball over the plate, but not getting it in good position. Three and six is his record this year, and his battery mate is the veteran, uh, Bob Melvin. And uh, all of the Oriole pitchers uh, feel like Melvin handles them very well. There's the defense, Cal Ripken Jr. Only made three errors last year. Billy Ripken, his brother's at second base. Randy Milligan is at first. And Leo Gomez is over at third base. In the outfield, Mike Devereaux, fine defensive outfielder. He'll be flanked by David Segui in left and Joe Orsalak in right. This is the fourth game of a series here in Baltimore. A very well attended series. They had uh, last night more than 45,000 people here. Although the Blue Jays scored six in the eighth and won the ball game. The Orioles won Thursday night, six to four. Malaki over the reliever Timlin. Olsen a save. And then Friday night, the Orioles won again, six to four. Roy Smith, he's been perfect since being called up for the minors. Olsen another save. And then the Jays got their first one of the series last night. The ace, Jimmy Key, winning his ninth game of the season. So the Blue Jays looking to gain a split out of the four game set. And the Orioles, who've had such a terrible time of it in 1991. They're looking to take three or four from the first place team in the division. Here we go. And Ballard to Devon White with a called strike. And we are underway. 87 degrees is the game time temperature. And it feels a little sticky here in Baltimore. This is Baltimore's baseball weather. On the outside corner for a called strike, too. Al Clark is the home plate umpire. Devon White hitting 284 for his new team with a home run and 27 batted in. Well, he's hitting 333 right-handed, 262 from the left side. He's hit one home run, and that has come from the right side. So he's a little more power from the right side, and he's actually swinging the bat better, although he has a lot fewer at-bats from the right side. The on-field plays him straight away. The two-strike offering, the curve just off the outside. One and two. We can get an indication early of how effective Ballard would be. He was out in front 0-2. Let's see if Devon White gets a good swing at it. Breaking ball in the dirt, 2-2. Two two. Well, Jeff Ballard was 18-8 and eight, and the ace of the staff in 1989 when the Orioles took these Blue Jays to the final weekend of the season. And uh, the hotter the pennant race got, the better Ballard got that year. Right to Bill Ripken. Not just right to him, but he he handled it, and there is one away. When your hit pitcher gets ahead 0-2, usually he tries to make the hitter fight the pitch off. Devon White gets a good swing at this pitch, and Ripken has to go to his left and make a good catch. The ball is actually lower than it looked like at first. Nice catch by Billy Ripken. Look, it might have even fooled him a little right. bit. Uh, a lot of action, apparently, on that liner. Here is Roberto Alomar, another switch hitter. And the Blue Jays have five of them. That's a strike on the outside. They've got four switch hitters in the starting lineup. And this has been a trademark of the Blue Jays the last number of years. Always a lot of versatility in their batting order. Alomar hitting 282. The big curve is too high. He has five homers, 28 batted in, and he leads the league with 17 doubles. And as you can see there, he's doing some of his best hitting of the year right now. In the right field, this is Joe Orsolak. Out number two. And Joe uh, Morgan in this ballpark, most of the way around, it's a fair park for a home run, and the ball seems to carry well here. But if you hit it down either line, you've got a friendly home run porch in either corner. Well, it's only 309 down the lines, and straight away it's about 360. So it is a very fair hitter's ballpark. The ball doesn't carry as well straight away as you would like, but fair hitter's ballpark. Joe Carter can hit it out in any direction here. And he hit one out just uh, the night before last, deep to left field. He's got 10 home runs to lead the Blue Jays. There's ball one. Well, they gave up a lot of offense when they traded uh, McGriff, and they allowed Bell to go free agent. They did get Carter in return, but so far, he has been the big home run hitter and just about the only home run hitter. Blue Jays are a completely different ball club in the lineup right now. They have uh, not very much power. But well, this time last year, they had 77 home runs. Now they've got 37. Quite a drop-off for Cito Gaston's group. 
Randy Milligan gives chase. And it's out of play. The stands come out real close to the field here. If you're going after a foul pop right away from first base toward the dugout, you've got some room. But down the line, uh, not much room at all, as you see there. And that was Cito Gaston and his hitting instructor, Gene Tennis, former Oakland A's World Championship teams. He was a catcher there when the A's won their championships three in a row. One and two to Joe Carter inside. Gene Tennis, let me think, Joe. I have a I don't like I don't think I wish I wouldn't have brought his name up. 1972, <laughs> I believe, and he tied yeah. a World Series record, did he not? Yes, against the Reds. What did you tell those pitchers to throw him in that series, Joe? <laughs> Joe and Joe the count. Outside, three and two. Gene Tennis. His name comes up in managerial conversations sometimes. He was interviewed by the Cardinals last year when they had the opening. Right. Gino is called by his friends. What do you call him? Gene. In public. <laughs> Four homers he had. Yeah. Privately, I still yell at him because I would have had another championship ring if not for Gene Tennis. Tennis that year was a guy who just played occasionally. Right. Nobody had ever heard of him, and there he was in the World Series against the Big Red Machine, and he went nuts. He got hot and he tied Babe Ruth's records and a lot of things. Swung the bat very well. We could, well, he hung a lot of pitches to him. That's the other problem. You can't do that to good hitters. So he found out he could hit a hanger. So can this guy, Joe Carter. Pops this one up. Milligan, the first baseman, in foul territory. And Ballard sets the side down in order. Now Todd Stratelmeyer will take them out for the Blue Jays. No score after one half. At uh, Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, Sunday night baseball. Next year, they'll be in a new ballpark here in Baltimore. Here's the starting lineup for the homestanding Baltimore Orioles. It'll be Mike Devereaux leading off in center field. Smoke and Joe O in right field batting second. Cal Ripken at shortstop. Sam Horn hit his ninth homer last night, the designated hitter. Leo Gomez, rookie at third base. David Segui, another young talent in left field. Randy Milligan, his left thumb is bothering him at first base. Bob Melvin, the veteran catcher. And batting ninth at second base is Bill Ripken. And they're facing the Toronto right-hander. Todd Stottlemyre. Well, Stottlemyre started off 5 and 0. Oh. He's a, he throws hard. He can move the ball inside. He's not afraid to pitch inside. Been pretty consistent so far this year. He was, uh, as you say, 5 and 0. Oh. Pat Borders is his battery mate. And in his last three starts, he's uh, struggled, losing two of them and having a no decision, and has not been able to go more than five innings in any of them. And defensively. Roberto Alomar at second base. Fine defensive second baseman. Pat Tabler is over at first. Good hitter. Manny Lee takes over at shortstop. And Ed Sprague Jr. is over at third. Devon White acquired over the winner. Fine defensive center fielder. Glenn Allen Hill takes over in right in place of Joe Carter tonight. And Mark Ripken. Whitkin. Mark Whitten. I'll get it right in a minute. Mark Whitten is in right. And Glenn Allen Hill is in left. Joe Carter is DHing tonight. He was scheduled to start in left field. There's Cito Gaston, flanked by his pitching coach, Galen Sisko. And we asked him before the ball game about his pitcher, Todd Stottlemyer. And here's what he said. Todd's pitched well this year. Uh, he's had some rough times the uh, last three times out, but um, he's pitched, you know, not just being a thrower. He's been out there pitching, getting his curveball over early in the count, his changeup, and uh, he's pitched more this year than just going out there just throwing the ball hard. So here he is, and he'll face Mike Devereaux to start it off. Devereaux, as you see, Stottlemyre's first eight starts, and then the problems the last three times, graphically illustrated there. Devereaux hitting 291, which is low ball one. He's got seven home runs and 18 RBIs. This is his best start, and uh, he's changed his approach. Uh, Great working with his hitting instructor, Tom McCraw. And it's inside a jaw. What they're saying about Devereaux is that he's just a little more patient and waiting a little longer for the ball this year. What, what does that mean to you? Well, the other thing he's done is he's gone to a heavier bat. 2-0 the count and ball three. And the longer you wait, the less chance of being fooled. If you wait a little longer, the breaking ball that breaks into the dirt you will not chase, or the high fastball out of the strike zone you will not chase. So 
waiting gives you an opportunity to make sure you get a good pitch to hit. So his walks are up and his batting average is way up. He hit only 240 last year. Takes the fastball three and one to Devereaux. Joe Orsalak and Cal Ripken will follow. There's a little bit of a breeze tonight that is blowing straight out of the ballpark. Ball four. So Devereaux starts it off with a walk for the Orioles. And you see there's not much of a breeze blowing the flag out in center field. It is 87 degrees. And uh, the relative humidity is uh, relatively low. No chance of rain. We're glad to hear that. No score in the game as Joe Orsalak comes up. Sunday night baseball from Baltimore. This ballpark, uh, home of the Orioles since they moved here in 1954. And uh, this is the 38th season of residency for the Orioles, but they will move downtown to a new ballpark next year. And we'll give you a look at that new ballpark under construction uh, during the telecast. Strike one to Orsalai. He's hitting 245, two home runs, and 11 RBIs. Devereaux, really the only base stealing threat the Orioles have right now. He's stolen eight, been caught three. Tambler on the bag with him. The former manager, Frank Robinson, who now, after being uh, fired as manager, is the assistant general manager of the Orioles. Talking about Devereaux and saying that he's very cautious as a base dealer. You know? Everything has to be absolutely right for him to want to go. What was that they said about Frank Robertson? They were reassigning him? And Frank said, no, I was fired. <laughs> Sounds like Frank. Yes. And that's up and away. He did not accept that reassignment right away he thought about it for a good long time and then finally decided that uh, he would become the assistant general manager he wanted to make sure that it was a real job with real responsibilities not just being kicked upstairs Devereaux back and uh, reportedly he'll be involved in trades and uh, make up of the ball club in the future and also he will be and has been in the past very much involved in the Construction of the new ballpark downtown. One and one to Orsalot. Well, Stottlemyre very concerned about Devereaux. Well, Devereaux was leaning the wrong way and he almost got picked off. Here's Todd Stottlemyre. He leaps up and throws to first base. A couple of years ago, that was a balk. If you jumped and made a throw to first base because you weren't really stepping where you were throwing. One ball and two strikes now to Orsalak. This Orioles ball club started the year with very high hopes after acquiring Glenn Davis, also picking up the veteran uh, Dwight Evans. But then they lost Glenn Davis only 12 games into the season. He had only 41 at bats for the club. And he has been out ever since. And the club has struggled terribly. They've rolled back again. One ball, two strikes to Orsalak. Baseman Ed Sprague takes it. One away. Watch Stalmar's right heel. You have to lift that in order to throw to first base. So I'm taking it that he didn't throw to first on that one. No, he did not. <laughs> Here's Cal Ripken. See how well I've learned what you've yeah. taught me, Joe? <laughs> Here's Cal. He's hitting 359. No way I would have been picked off on that one. Well, let me take that one step farther. In, in order for a guy to throw to first base, he has to lift his heel. When he goes to the plate, he just rocks back on that heel. And that's what he did then. Into the seats. And uh, Devereaux will go to second. The ball. Hit a fan. Quick thinking fan over there. The ball kind of popped right up into his hands, and they said, No, wait a minute. And he dropped it. While well, he's trying to make a quick throw because he caught Devereaux leaning once before. Now he jumps and fires. 
but it bounces short and goes down into the bullpen towards the bullpen and all of a sudden it's well Tabler starts after it but as soon as he gets over there a fan has already touched it so the ball is dead and you can only get one base Cal Ripken the hitter hitting 359 ball one Cal leading the American League at the start of the day second in the league to him was Seattle's Edgar Martinez who started the day at 350 and you see the Cal seems to get hotter as the season goes along very rare when a right handed hitter hits that high this late in the season. Popped up. This is the first baseman, Tabler, foul ground. And uh, Devereaux tags at second, bluffs. The throw comes across to Manuel Lee. The center fielder, Devon White, crept in behind Devereaux just in case. Two down, and Sam Horn is coming up. Joe, I mentioned to Cal before the ball game. Now you had kind of compared to what he was doing right this year with his stance as to what he was doing last year and he says I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> don't tell me about this. In a hot streak he doesn't want to think about it he doesn't want to analyze it. He's got things under control. Big Sam so I suppose if he has a bad night tonight it's my fault. <laughs> Chase the high one. I had an interesting talk with uh, Cal Ripken Sr. about why he went, you know, to the stance where he bends his knees a little bit more and he moved his bat a little more forward into the hitting area. He said that's the way that he hit when he came up in 1983, that he bent his knees a little more than last year. He had almost gotten to the point where he was standing almost straight up and his back foot was, back leg was straight, so when he strided forward, it's like throws you off balance. You can't keep your balance if you're striding to a stiff leg. Cal Ripken, back in 1983, the Orioles won a World Series and he was the MVP. Tabler was playing it right on the line. That's where Horn hit it. And the side is retired. There was a walk and an error. One man left. After one, no score. A beautiful sunset uh, here in Baltimore as we bring you Sunday night baseball on ESPN. Let me see if I've got this down. From the geographer, that is the West. Setting in the West tonight, Joe. <laughs> it's at the knee sometimes. See, you probably couldn't have gotten that because you're not that familiar with Baltimore. <laughs> Setting in the West tonight. Always very beautiful when it does that. Here's Pat Tabler getting clean up of the Blue Jays. Ed Sprague and Mark Witten will follow. That's how I tell it's San Francisco when I look at the skylight when I'm in California. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that helpful tip because next Sunday, that's where we'll be. Exactly. I'll just head in that direction. Head for the sunset. Watch the skylight. Next Sunday night, 8 p.m., Sunday night baseball takes you to Candlestick Park as the Giants take on the Pittsburgh Pirates. Ballard uh, with the changeup outside for a ball. One and one to Tabler. No score in this game. Eight o'clock next Sunday. The Giants, Will Clark, Willie McGee, Matt Williams, uh, Mitchell won't be back. And the pitch is high. The Pittsburgh Pirates got beaten a couple of times this weekend by San Diego, but they still have the best record in all of Major League Baseball. And most of their players have not had good seasons yet. And most of them are proven players, and they will have good seasons. Now Ripken slinging through the first to get Tabler. One away. Last year, Cal Ripken Jr. only made three errors the entire season, which is a major league record. And he did not win a gold glove. The reason is, according to the voters anyway, he doesn't cover as much ground as Ozzie Guillen does. And therefore, he may not be the, they think he's not the best defensive shortstop in the American League. Here's Ripken getting ready. Now watch him bounce just before the pitch is hit. The ball starts on the inside part of the plate, so he moves that way. Here's Ed Sprague, and the curve is in there for a strike. On one. Cal Ripken made uh, three errors last year, and uh, Guillen made uh, 17. So he must have gotten to a lot more balls. Still have won the award. There is Orsolai. 
Somebody made the comment, and I tend to do agree with him. If Cal Ripken doesn't win the award last year, Tony Fernandez should have won it. I mean, he covers a lot of ground. There's never been a question about it, and he only made the eight or nine errors last year. Well, the same thing happened in the National League. Jose Oquendo set a major league record for fewest errors by a second baseman. He only made three the entire season. And Ryan Sandberg won the gold glove for defense in the National League. Now here is uh, Mark Witten, switch hitter, batting right-handed. This guy they think is going to be a star, but there's also a lot of teams when the Blue Jays talk to them about acquiring a pitcher and say, well, we'd like Mark Witten. Quickly, Toronto has not had a base runner as yet. No score after one and a half. Thank you very much, Chris Bourbon. This is John Miller with the real Joe Morgan. Here is Leo Gomez leading it off. Joe and I, as we drove to Memorial Stadium today, picked up the Yankee game on right. the radio, yeah. just as Don Mattingly, very dramatically with his club trailing, against a left-hander brought in just to face him hit a two-run homer. Gomez takes a strike from Stoppelmeyer. Crowd went nuts in an inning later against Goose Gossage of all people. The rookie Pat Kelly hit a two-run homer and the Yankees won that game. Haven't heard a roar like that at Yankee Stadium for a long time, Joe. <laughs> they are hot. Look at it. Ball and a strike. There's Stoppelmeyer. As Joe mentioned earlier, not afraid to come inside. You have to pitch inside to be effective if you don't throw real hard. You have to keep the hitters honest. There's Gomez leaning out of the way. Here's a high drive in the left field. Going back, this one has a chance, and this one is gone. A home run. The first ever for Leo Gomez is a big leaguer. One to nothing, Baltimore. Into that home run porch in left. Well, Stottlemyre was trying to get the pitch inside, and he did not. This fastball is over the middle of the plate, and Gomez drives it right out of there. Pretty good swing by Gomez in that he kept his weight distributed pretty well he did not get out in front of the pitch and he wasn't leaning back ball that's not always the case when you do hit a home run sometimes you're on your back leg sometimes you get fully out in front you just lift it out of here but he was in good bat had good balance here's David Segui he like Todd Stottlemyre the pitcher he's facing the son of a former major leaguer Ever face a Diego Segui? Yes. Faces. Here's the two on delivery. Down to the field line with Powell. Slicing back and dropping in amongst the spectators. And I faced Todd's father, Mel. So. And I played against Sandy's father, <laughs> Roberto's father, Sandy. Is this a sore subject with you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> These guys are all grown up now. Yes, they are. Well, you're looking good, though. <laughs> That's fouled, and it is two and two. Does Todd Stottlemyre remind you at all of, of no. his father? No, his father was a sinker ball pitcher, had a real good sinker. He never got a ball above the belt. And Todd, as we noted, pitches up in the end. He'll pitch inside, and he throws a little harder than his father did. And his ball, you know, is a lot straighter. Two and two, the count to Segui, switch hitter. Stottlemyre will take it himself. And there is one away. So that'll bring up Randy Milligan. Milligan the other night hurt himself diving for a ball playing first base and suffered a slight sprain of his left thumb. They fitted him with a little uh, apparatus to go around the thumb, but he tried it in batting practice tonight and he said before the game that he preferred not to use it. Hitting is a uh, like from feel you have to have good feeling in your hands and when you put an extra pad or something between your hands and the bat 
you don't have the same feel. You can't feel the barrel of the bat as well as you can without anything on there. Well, check swing, the appeal. And uh, denied by Larry Barnett. He rules in favor of Milligan. One ball, one strike. One to nothing. Baltimore ahead here in the second. Melvin on deck. In the right field, pretty deep. Going back is Witten, and now he's got room. Four out, number two. And with two down here, let's go to Chris Berman. All right, John, thank you. You talk, you notice the Yankees. If seeing is believing, check it out. Bottom of the eighth, the Goose. Goose Gossett. Serves went up to the rookie, Pat Kelly. A two-run shot. Yankees homering late again. And the Yankees beat Texas 6-4. Let's go back to you in Baltimore. Thanks, Chris. We were hoping to see that after we'd heard uh, John Sterling and his partner Joe Angel broadcast that on the radio as we drove over here today. It's just the way they described it. Here's the ball too high to Bob Melvin. One ball and no strikes. Melvin started out with Detroit, went to San Francisco, now here with uh, Baltimore. Off the fists to Alamar. And that ends the inning. But the Leo Gomez home run, his first ever as a major leaguer, has uh, given the Orioles the lead. Orioles won, Blue Jays nothing after two. Sunday night baseball from Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. The Orioles ahead one nothing. That flag says here, and it is uh, atop the left field grandstand here. And 25 years ago, that is the spot where Frank Robinson hit a home run against Louis Tiant that left the ballpark right at that spot. And in the history of this ballpark, this is the 38th season. That is still the only ball ever to have been hit, uh, hit completely out of Memorial Stadium. They uh, commemorate that with the sign here. The batter is uh, Pat Borders. And it looks like he may always be the only one ever to have hit it out. Uh, yes. Time is running out. That's down the right field line and foul. Pat Borders had an outstanding season last year. He was up around 300 all season, hit with power. But this year, in the month of April, he went two for 28. And they started platooning him with uh, Myers. So lately, he's been facing primarily just the left handers. But he has hit 365 since that terrible beginning. There you see it. And his season's average now 263. But no homers and only four RBIs. Down the right field line, slicing back and out of play. Two and two the count. There's John Oates, the new manager of the Orioles. Former catcher. Played quite a few years against Johnny Oates. He fought for the Atlanta Braves. Any truth to the notion that being a catcher gives you a leg up and being a good manager? I don't know about giving you a good manager. It gives you a better perspective of a pitching staff. Gives you a chance to understand the pitching staff. Three and two now, Ballard to Borders. Well, one thing that has improved since Oates became the manager has been the pitching staff. He has restructured the bullpen, and uh, they've given up a lot fewer runs. Should be an easy play for Joe Orsalag. It is. Coming up Wednesday on ESPN, the Baseball Network. It will be the Los Angeles Dodgers, Juan Samuel having a great start. And those Pittsburgh Pirates with Barry Bonds, Bobby Bonilla and company. Samuel hitting 330 for the Dodgers. And of course they've got Eddie Murray and Cal Daniels. They've got plenty of talent on that club. The two division leaders right now in the National League Wednesday night, 730 Eastern on Wednesday night baseball here on ESPN. Manuel Lee takes a strike. The eighth place hitter, another Toronto switch hitter batting right handed. I'm glad you said Manuel Lee before I called him Manny. <laughs> well, you know what, what happens sometimes? Player comes in from the Caribbean and they sort of Americanize his name. Uh, for instance, your uh, longtime teammate Tony Perez was uh, Atanasio, was his name. But uh, Manny Lee just decided, hey, Nobody ever called me Manny my whole life. I like being called Manuel. That's my name. I wonder if Manny Trio's name was Manuel. Probably was. But he never complained. All he did was hit and play good defense. 
one of the best arms of a second baseman. You'll ever see. A check swing and uh, Barnett denies Melvin's appeal. Three and one. Manuel Lee. He, like the other right-handed, well, the other switch hitters in the lineup are better hitters from the right side. Out of play. Three and two. Alomar, Devon White, and Manuel Lee all hit better average-wise from the right side. Has he hurt himself here? He had a rib cage injury that put him on the shelf for a while. He's been back in the lineup for about 10 days. Usually, if you have a rib injury or something wrong with your back, it hurts more when you swing and miss rather than when you make contact. Or so like they fight the lights here in that area, but he was able to uh, stay with it and to duck under the plane of the lights to make the catch. There's John Oates again. We were talking about Oates, the manager, and uh, the little changes he's made. And there's what the Orioles had done under Frank Robinson. And you see that 5.3 runs allowed per game, that ERA. Since Oates has come in in the 16 games, you can see that uh, that runs per game has gone way down. Actually, all of the teams that have changed managers actually have a better record than the other managers did, except here, I guess. I mean, they were over 500. Well, when Oates came in, the Orioles proceeded immediately to lose four straight games. This is the uh, Glenn Allen Hill to Orsalak. And Orsalak takes care of the whole Blue Jay uh, attack in the inning. Three fly balls to Orsalak. One nothing Baltimore after two and a half. Joe Morgan back here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore where you played 1983 the World Series. Well I had a great time here. I was always looking forward to playing here in Baltimore because they had such great tradition. They'd won a lot of great uh, pennants here and they had a lot of great defensive players and defense has always been something I like to watch. Joe Morgan. And how did that series come out again. <laughs> you won't let me forget that will you Philadelphia your team won the first game. I remember that. Yeah we won the first game. That was the only game we won. The O's uh, were lucky. I didn't remember. Here is Bill Ripken, second baseman. Ball one. From Todd Stottlemyre. But it was interesting. I remember you telling me about some of the old historic parks like Wrigley Field and Fenway Park and Comiskey Park. Ball outside Tiger Stadium. But you picked this one. As a place you had wanted to, you look forward to playing in. Well, I remember watching the World Series and watching Jim Palmer, watching uh, Frank Robinson, Brooks Robinson, all the great players play in the World Series. That's a fair ball past Sprague. Glenn Allen Hill has to go into the corner for it, and a double for Bill Ripken. They've been giving Ripken a lot of the line in this whole series and last night he hit a ball inside the line like this and it actually ended up with a double and an error he got a triple out of it he went to third base since a smash down the line Sprague is way off the line as you can see and they've been planning that way the entire series and last night he hit a ball right over the bag like that so Bill Ripken who got off to a real slow start this year and he had uh, problems with the, a disc herniation in his back I'm not sure what that means, but it doesn't sound good. Well, it sounds like the uh, Blue Jays have a herniation in their computer system, the way they're playing him. I mean, they're playing him way off the line, and the guy's constantly pulling the ball down the that line. It would be a floppy disk herniation. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, a floppy disk herniation. herniation. Ball one to Devereaux. <laughs> That's a cold strike, one and one. Devereaux walked his first time. One to nothing, Baltimore ahead in the last of the third. In this situation, Devereaux should make sure he gets the ball to the right side. It doesn't mean a ground ball, but at least hit the ball in the air that way. Like or, he tried to. Yes, or get a base hit that way. You have to take a shot to right field with no one out and a runner at second base, especially in a close ball game. And the Orioles are not a team that's going to blow you out, so they need to scratch and claw for every run that they can get. Well, and that has been uh, one of the problems with their offense. They have not been able to so-called manufacture runs. Exactly. They don't run real well and uh, they just don't do much except play for the beginning. That's a foul straight back. That was a 
sidearm breaking ball from Stottlemyre. There you see the Orioles a tenth in the league in sacrifices. And they're not hitting very well with runners in scoring position, runners on base. And they're last in the American League in stolen bases. Still trying to go to right, it looks like. One and two the count. Not a very good combination. No. Devereaux was just fighting that ball off. I don't know if he was trying to go to right field or not. He was just fighting that one off. Always trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. <laughs> He's a team man, Joe. Even if it was right toward his nose, he'd try to go to right with it, I think. Well, he pulled. <laughs> I thought he might try to go to right with that one. And he is unable to get Bill Ripken over. And so it goes for the Orioles. A familiar lament in this season of their discontent. Now Orsalak. The Orioles in 53 games have hit 53 home runs, even without the big slugger Glenn Davis in the lineup. But when they don't hit home runs, they have a, a terrible time scoring. Well, you mentioned they do not have a lot of team speed. The way the game is now, you have to add some speed to your lineup in order to be a successful team over 162 ball games. If you can't manufacture some runs by stealing bases, hitting and running, moving the runners along, you're just not going to score a lot of runs. Pitching now is set up so that they can go to your weaknesses, and because the defenses can set themselves so well, it's awfully tough just to go out and hit, 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 and hit the ball out of the ballpark and get a lot of base hits. They're playing around to pull. One strike to Orsalak. He popped the third his first time. It's foul down the left field line. 0 and 2 the count. One to nothing. Baltimore ahead on the home run by Gomez, which was the team's 54th of the year. Orsalak in a terrible slump. The last three years, he's been up at the top of this club in hitting. Most of the year. This time last year, he was hitting 320. But right to Manuel Lee. And still in second is Bill Ripley. Now with two down, and uh, his uh, big brother Cal is coming out. The brothers Ripken, and uh, of course, the father is the third base coach. And at one time, he was the manager. Just one big Ripken family here at the ballpark. What do you think, Joe? The, remember the the novel East of Eden about the brothers and uh, Steinbeck novel. There could be some little hidden things uh, could create problems with brothers on the ballpark. Back to Stottlemyre. So Cal Ripken is 0 for 2, and Bill Ripken with a leadoff double and never got past second base. Baltimore one, Toronto nothing after three. The view from above of Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, the uh, Orioles, the hometown team, won, and the Blue Jays nothing. Next Sunday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Pacific, 2 o'clock Hawaiian, 7 o'clock Chicago, <laughs> 6 o'clock Rocky Mountain. I think that pretty well covers it. Sunday night baseball from San Francisco and the Pittsburgh Pirates, Bonds and Bonilla, the Buccos and the Giants. Will Clark missed it in the last uh, couple of days. Did not play today again, although the Giants won in St. Louis. There's a curveball to Devon White. Ball one from Jeff Ballard. Well, we'll hope he's back by next Sunday. Or we always like to watch Will Clark. Oh. Will does not stay out of the lineup too long. <laughs> he's a gamer. It turned out he played a good long time last year, injured. And it didn't help his batting average much. Two and over the count. That's deep in the left field, and forget about it. Sagi so just watches it go. A booming home run for Devon White, only his second of the year, and the game is all tied up. I talked to Cito Gaston before the ball game about the new additions to his ball club, Devon White, Alomar, Carter. He said these guys have been fantastic. He said Devon White has played a great center field and he's been just a real good guy to have on the ball club and Cito is just really happy to have. Him. And Devon White does have a lot of talent. Melvin is set up on the outside part of the plate and this is what I was talking about. Ballard throws a strike but it's in the middle of the plate. And they threw the ball back on the field. 
which is unbelievable. As a kid, you go out and try to get a ball, <laughs> and you just wish you could get a baseball from the Major League game, and all of a sudden, they throw it back on the field. That's a strike. Well, it must not have been some kid who caught it. No, but I guarantee you there are some kids in the bleachers out there that would love to have it. Must have been somebody who just moved here from Chicago. <laughs> the north side, that's a ball. One ball, one strike. They started that at Wrigley Field, right? The bad guys hit a home run, they tossed it back. Here is Roberto Alomar. A ball and two strikes. To continue, to continue the thought on the new players for Toronto. You know, Roberto Alomar is a guy that is the ultimate team player, according to Cito Gaston. I mean, this guy, all he thinks about is doing the job for the team. He said he gives himself up for the team. He just does whatever is necessary to help the team win. Down on strikes this time. And that's the first strikeout for Ballard. We're in the top of the fourth inning, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Memorial Stadium in Baltimore is our venue. The first place, Toronto Blue Jays won, and the Orioles won. Top of the fourth, the teams have exchanged home runs up till now. As Joe Carter gets ready to bat. Leo Gomez, the Orioles rookie, hit his first ever home run back in the second. Now Devon White has blasted one here in the fourth. And the ball one to Joe Carter. He fouled the first his first time. Joe Carter is probably the best player in all of the major leagues that has never made an all-star team. It's unbelievable. The guy's driven in 100 runs four out of the last five years and averaged 24 home runs a year. But he has never been selected to a major league all-star team. Well, he went to San Diego and he did not, you know, had a bad batting average. But, but he, he drove, drove in 115. <laughs> Base hit past the diving Bill Ripken. And uh, Carter is boy. He's hitting for average this year. He's been up around 290 during this series. He has had some excellent years batting average-wise as well. He just struggled a little bit last year. He was making the adjustment to a new league. But he was also producing runs for the guys. He was driving in runs when they got in scoring position. This pitch is away, and Carter just goes the other way with it. Good piece of hitting by Joe Carter. You can see that he's going to right field all the way. And he smashes it past Ripken. That's the approach you'd expect from a guy hitting 290, not 220. Well, he kept his front shoulder in. And that's what you do when you go to right field. You don't pull off and try to take the ball the other way. You'll hit a lot of pop-ups to the right side. Pat Tabler grounded a short his first time, hitting cleanup, and he takes a strike on one. Tabler's really struggling for a guy that's always been a good hitter. Tabler's been a good hitter from the first day he got to the major leagues. He's just never had a position. When he came up with the Cubs, he, they tried to make him a second baseman. He didn't play as well there. He's a third baseman. He has just not had a position his entire career, but he's always been a good hitter. Ball strike, and Tabler shoots a quick glance back at Al Clark. And as old, old players used to say, what position does he play? Batter's box. That's about it. He can swing the bat, but he does not have a defensive position. Now the Blue Jays picked him up as a free agent. He's ended last year with the Mets. Gives him some deep depth. Good man in a pinch. He leads the club in pinch hitting. Four for ten. He's had a phenomenal record of hitting with the bases loaded, which is, you know, like unbelievable. But that tells me that he's a smart hitter. He realizes that if he waits, he's going to get good pitch to hit. Two and two. He's hit 500 in his career with the bases loaded. Oh, you call that phenomenal? Yeah, 41 for 82. That's not phenomenal. Yeah, we're not it's ridiculous. Even, we're not talking about 5 for 10 or 10 for 20. 41 for 82. That will go foul. On the right field line. 2-2 two two. to Pat Tabler. There it is. It's in print now. <laughs> That's 82 at bats and 100 RBIs in those situations. Some guys are just the opposite. Yes, most guys are just the opposite. Fill the bases and they can't hit anything. In the center, Devereaux. Toward right center a bit. Back to the bag and tagging was Carter. 
who also runs uh, real well. But he was just bluffing. Carter stolen 10 bases, and he's also a member of the 30 30 club. And Joe, you're talking about uh, the Orioles in the, the third. They had a chance to, to manufacture a run, and they didn't. It's been a failing for them all year. The Blue Jays have gone sort of the different direction. They've given up a lot of power. They've hit only 37 homers. They had 77 at this point last year. But they've added some speed. They have stolen 52 bases. And they've also sacrificed a lot more and hit behind the runner. They've done a lot more of the things you do when you have to manufacture a run. They've gone from the big bomb to the little bombs. There goes Carter. Melvin's throw. Hyatt is retired. Sprague will lead off in the fifth for the Blue Jays. Back to three and a half, one to one from Baltimore. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball is brought to you by Bud Dry. Dry brewed so it drinks light yet satisfies completely. And by Wheaties. Better get your whole grain, better eat your Wheaties. And you're looking at the famed uh, inner harbor of Baltimore, a great tourist area in a beautiful part of the city. Twelve years ago, it was a uh, place you would never, ever go. But uh, they got it done down there, and now it's uh, quite a show place down in the inner harbor. Here's Sam Horn. Grounded out his first time to the first baseman. Horn averaging one home run for every 12 at-bats this year. His last eight base hits, five of them have been home runs. On the other hand, in 108 at bats this year, he has struck out 40 times. And the count is 0 and 2. Stattelmeyer. And that's a ball. 1 and 2 to count. Big Sam, he got some pretty numbers. Nine homers, only 108 at bats, 22 battered in. He's second of the club in RBIs. Still plays half the time. Two and two. Born the first game he ever played as an Oriole, opening day last year, hit two three run homers in Kansas City, one of them against Brett Saberhig. Well, now it's three and two. Was 0 and 2. And Sam has the flair for dramatic uh, moments. He had a grand slam earlier this year to spoil Milwaukee's home opener. They had brought in a pitcher out of the bullpen expressly to face Sam Horn. 3 2 pitch is fouled away off to the left. The play that ended the inning. For the Blue Jays' last thing was Carter being thrown out in second. He got an excellent jump. It's just a bad slide because he should have been in there. He's hit right on the knee just before he touches the bag. Nice tag by Billy Ripken. But if Carter would have slid to the inside, he would have been safe. It's one of the lost arts when you steal a base. Most guys go straight in. Maury Wills. Who was one of the great, great base dealers of all time? He slid to the outside if the throw was on the inside. If the throw was on the outside, he slid to the inside. And he avoided many a tag that way. Well, Sam Horn, who broke his bat in that last foul ball, ends up getting a walk after starting at 0 and 2. There's the panoramic view of Memorial Stadium. You see those outfield bleachers. With the high wall that goes out behind the lower fence, the home run fence. When this ballpark first opened, you had to hit it into those bleachers to get a home run. Where it says 376 there, at that time, to hit one out of the ballpark into the bleachers, 420 feet. It was the toughest home run ballpark in the majors. Here's Leo Gomez, who homered his first time, ball one. And the hometown team. That first year, the Orioles hit 19 homers the whole season in their own ballpark. <laughs> the man who led the club, Vern Stevens, hit eight. Home and away. Gomez has been hot since being called up. 2-0. Oh. It's kind of similar to the park we'll be in next 
week. San Francisco, Candlestick Park. They've got a fence, inner fence now. They had it after the first year. But the first year they opened up, you had to hit the ball all the way into the seats. And even the great, great Willie Mays and McCovey and those guys had problems getting home runs that year. I recall Mays only hit 29 that year. Yeah, only. You're right. <laughs> Any place else, he'd probably would have hit 15. Ball strike at the inside. Two and one. Well, Stoudemire goes right back inside on Gomez. He wanted to pitch him inside to start with. And he threw a couple of pitches inside, and then he set up out. Then the catcher set up outside, and he threw the ball in the middle of the plate. So he wants to stay in tight on Gomez. That must be the book that they want to follow by turning the ball over inside. Popped him up. Shallow right. Alomar goes out, and the, the, the right fielder Witten calls him off. And he got the ball back inside. And there you Gomez see. popped it up. Excuse me, Joe. There you see the wind blowing out a little bit tonight. Now, out in that area where those uh, temporary bleachers are, it's 405 feet to straightaway center. In the old days here, there was a hedge at 450 feet away. That was the center field fence, and the hedge kind of hooked up the left field uh, bleachers with the right field bleachers. Mickey Mantle once crushed one here to that hedge, and a guy named Chuck Deering leaped up, caught it, and fell right into the hedge. Mantle got nothing for his blast. Here's David Segui. You imagine being a guy who played for that club? You come in here the first year of the club, 1954. You've never seen the ballpark. What do you I, think your reaction? I really don't been? think it's that unfair, John. All he had to do was pull it. That's right. Just pull the ball. I guess that was their theory. Yeah, 309 down each line. And 450 to center. Yeah, I mean just pull it. The polo grounds was like that. Just pull the ball. Well, uh, or go the other way, you know, go down the line. Pitcher might make it difficult for you to pull it, though, right? Well, go the other way. <laughs> you got to go down each line, either line. Stoudemire is throwing a lot of pitches early on. Segui with a pop fly. And the left fielder, Glenn Allen Hill, has it. Two down, and Horn still at first. Well, this is the second straight inning. But the Orioles got a leadoff man aboard, and uh, he's just stood and watched the inning has proceeded. One of the things you do when you pitch inside, you slow a hitter's bat down because a lot of times he opens up a little quick with too quick trying to get to the pitch. And if he opens up too quick, that makes the bat drag through the hitting zone. That's one of the reasons I say you have to pitch inside to be successful because you can slow a good hitter's bat down by pitching in, pitching him inside. It's Donald Meyer to Milligan and the uh, curveball in there for a strike. Milligan flying to right his first time. One to one, last of the fourth. Two down, Horn at first. Horn from the uh, Ernie Lombardi School of uh, Base Running. He, uh, <laughs> he's not liable to steal a base. The Sam, big Sam. Gigantic fella, worked hard this winter to get his weight down. A lot of workouts, worked with weights. I'm sure by the attention. <laughs> he may just take off now. Sign hanging on the left field wall. Plenty of home run power in 1991. Inside. Two and two to Milligan. Milligan and Horn that grew up in the same area in Southern California. And there was a time when they felt it was not helping Milligan because Horn, who hits these monstrous home runs, kind of taught Milligan, said, hey, let's see you hit one like that. Milligan doesn't have much success when he tries. He is down here, first strikeout for Stottlemyre. One man left, one one time of the fifth in Baltimore. Thank you, Chris. The batter, Ed Sprague. First ball swinging, deep at third. The long throw by Gomez is in time. Ed Sprague Sr. was a pitcher who came up with that uh, those athletics uh, played in Oakland and was a teammate of yours for a while. Yeah, he was a teammate of mine in Cincinnati. Here's Gomez. He backs up on the play. And Sprague doesn't run real well, so he has time to set himself and throw across the diamond. And that brings up Mark Witten, switch hitter, who does run fairly well, takes a strike. Ed Sprague Sr. 
was he mostly a reliever, wasn't he? Yes, he was a reliever. He started a few games in 71 with the Reds. And the irony, here's Ed Sprague Jr. playing real well, hitting the ball well. And his father is a scout for the Baltimore Orioles. Mm -hmm. You think they'd call him up and uh, give us some tips? That's a base hit for Witten. That was a much better at bat for Mark Witten. The first time up, he just swing the swing off balance and try to pull the ball. And this at bat, at least he tries to go right back through the middle with it. He had had only one hit in his last 19 at bats until that base hit. Talking about Ed Sprague, the scout for the Orioles, the father of Ed Sprague Jr., and he has signed a number of the top young prospects currently in the Orioles' farm system. This is Borders, and he gets one into shallow left. A long run for Segui. He's got it. You know, this might be a sound fun to you, John. It's amazing to me how an outfielder can run that far and then slide and catch the baseball. I mean, I really mean that. You would seem that you would lose your perspective of where the ball is going to come down when you start your slide, but a lot of these guys do it, and that was a great play by Sagi. But I would just think that if I slid, I'd lose the ball. But well, it's amazing that they do it and they are able to come up with the catch. A guy I used to do it here a lot with the Orioles, Jim Dwyer, a guy mm -hmm. who played. Uh, a lot of years for a lot of teams. As Ballard faces Manuel Lee. Now going to second is Witten. And he's in there. Good base running by Witten. The ball did not get away from Melvin very far. But he knew that Melvin did not know where it was. And he took off immediately on the wild pitch. And he's safe at second base. Melvin's taking a little time. The ball nicked him a little bit. He's going to walk out and give himself a little time to get away from the plate. Watch the ball bounces up. It doesn't go very far. I see why. And it just stops right in front of him. Witten is running all the way. And he's in the second base easily. But uh, Jim Dwyer talking about that sliding type catch. And you see a lot of outfielders do it right. nowadays. He said it helped him uh, actually make the catch. And he wasn't bouncing any longer the way you might bounce when you're running. Right. Well, that maybe that's what happens. See, now when you start to slide, your head goes to a different position and everything. I, they tell you not to run on your heels because the ball will bounce because it jars your head. But when you slide, you also move your head. I'm, I'm just amazed. But they do it all the time and they make great plays. Well, you were a second baseman, Joe. <laughs> That's true. That's a strike to Manuel Lee. One ball, one strike. He lined out to right. His first time. Jeff Ballard involved in a 1 1 game in the fifth inning. Joe Orsalak, the right fielder, started affecting those sliding catches. The first year he was there, he, you know, he had a lot of speed. He'd run for 100 miles to catch a fly ball, but he would always drop it. And Frank Robinson determined that he was, in fact, running on his heels. Base hit for Lee. And this will get Witten home. The throw is cut off by Gomez. 2 to 1, Toronto. And again, you have to give Mark Witten a pat on the back because he, he basically stole that run when he took off for second base. We saw the ball did not get far away from Melvin, but he stole the base anyway or he went to second base. And on this ground ball in the hole, he scores easily. He has to wait till he gets past Gomez before he takes off. Gomez got a poor jump on the ball as well. But here comes Witten running, coming around third, and he can really run. The guy that's highest on him is Joe Carter. He says they should never trade this young guy. They th he Carter thinks he's going to be an excellent player. Well, the National had his name part of the rumor about the proposed deal, the Expos for Dennis Martinez. It said that one possible deal could have the Pat Borders, the catcher. Pitcher Dennis Boucher now in the minor leagues, but a French Canadian. And outfielder Mark Whitten. A deal for Martinez and maybe a, a young left-handed reliever as well. But Witten has the, a lot of things you look for in a player. Well, he's a switch hitter. I mean, he can hit the ball with power. I mean, he's going to be a good player. The thing that amazed me the most is when I stood up beside him today and see how big he is. I mean, he's a big fella and he can run. We just saw that. 
can also throw a punch, too. No. <laughs> what, have you been talking to Jack McDowell? <laughs> he, threw, he threw more than one, I think. Mark Witten, he's uh, only 24 years of age. And uh, what is it, back in 1987, he stole 49 bases down in the lower minors. The Hill hits the ball to Cal, Cal to his brother Bill, and they retire Manuel. Two to one Toronto now after four and a half. Plate realizes that um, who has seen or, or hit against me before realizes that I'm going to probably try to come in there sooner or later, and hopefully I can work the count to my favor to be able to use that to my advantage. So, but you know, there's some games where you, you know you can go in all you want and it's not going to do you any good. You have to be able to go ahead and get ahead and throw strikes, and then you can really use that to your advantage. Todd Stottlemyre talking about himself, his theories. Stottlemyre, 26 years of age now. And he's got a two-to-one lead. He has the lead for the first time. Facing Bob Melvin, leads it off for the Orioles here in the fifth. One and one. One uh, thing they've been waiting for from Stottlemyre, who's got all of the, the tools, as it were, he's got great ability, is for him to put the mental with the physical. And uh, that takes time. And uh, they felt like the maturing process for Todd Stottlemyre. Basically, what you're saying is he got a little bit too excited out there on the mound. <laughs> yes, yes, in, uh, in a manner of speaking, Joe. <laughs> strikes out Bob Melvin. And if things weren't going well, he might just try and rear back and right. throw one by you. Didn't always use his head out there. Well, after going inside, he goes away with a slider, and this is what he's talking about. If you pitch a guy inside, he can't look for that pitch out away from him the slider out over the outside part of the plate watch how he looks away from the, the plate just before he throws if you're a hitter does that bother you he's looking down at the ground <laughs> well most of the time as a hitter you're not looking in the pitcher's face you look at this release point Bill Ripken the hitter he doubled his first time and there's ball two two to one the Toronto Blue Jays lead the Orioles in the last of the fifth Bill Ripken, the ninth place hitter in the Orioles lineup. Game started, uh, started turning around in that third inning. Bill led off the inning with a double and never got any further than second base. And then the Blue Jays got a home run from White in the fourth, and then they kind of manufactured a run in the fifth to go ahead. The Orioles have not been able to do anything except go one base at a time in this one. Two and one. Devereaux, the leadoff hitter, is on deck. That's foul off to the right. Stalemar working into the fifth inning here. Giving up just the two hits. The Gomez homer and the Bill Ripken double. Two walks. A couple of strikeouts. And he has the lead. Toronto's got a pretty strong bullpen, too, once you get to that late inning. Part of the game with the lead. That's strike three to Bill Ripken. Three consecutive strikeouts for Stottlemyre. Well, he caught Ripken looking for a breaking ball. Ripken hit a fastball down the left field line last time up, so he figures he's going to come with a breaking ball, and Stottlemyre fires a fastball right on the outside corner. Good pitch. Stottlemyre and his reaction. Not much of a reaction. He's definitely not, not looking overexcited to me, Joe. Right. <laughs> Here's Devereaux. He's walked. And he's grounded a third. Two to one, Toronto. Ooh, he waved at a bad one. He's not like Joaquin Andohar, who used to shoot him as he struck him out. He's not from the Joaquin Andohar school of showing your emotions after you get a strikeout. And again, Oil Can Boyd is. Is Ed Sprague? He's got a pretty good arm from third base. Side retired, three up, three down. Blue Jays at the top of the order coming up when we return. Sure to win in double digits, try the lefty for the Angels, Chuck Finley. At home of the Big A against the Tigers today, went six and two thirds, struck out nine. Tigers gave up five hits, also helped the Dave Winfield. Hit home run number 12 on the year, 390 lifetime. Finley and Tom Glavin of the Braves have each won 10. Back to Baltimore.
Two to one the score here. The Blue Jays over the Orioles. Top of the sixth and the top of the order for the Blue Jays. Devon White has taken ball one from Jeff Ballard. White has lined out to second and he has hit a long home run to left. This one is foul. One ball one strike. Devon White things were going so bad for him that by last year the Angels sent him back to the minor leagues. Each year his average had fallen and I mean fallen precipitously. You see it. It ended up 217 last year. But now with this change of scenery he goes to Canada He's with the Blue Jays and it seems to be much more congenial for him. He is hitting 286 right up to the moment. And that's low three and one stolen some bases he has 11 steals he only has two home runs but he got 28 runs batted in and he's hit lead off most of the time been very productive a switch hitter and Ballard has walked him there's the final in the NBA championship series and the Bulls have pulled way ahead now Bulls 97 and the Lakers 82 here at Memorial Stadium Sunday night baseball and ESPN the first place Toronto Blue Jays lead the Orioles two to one we're in the top of the sixth inning and Roberto Alomar is the hitter with Devon White at first base and nobody out Alomar has flied to right and he has struck out he's a switch hitter batting right handed there goes White it was a hit and run and the ball is fouled by Roberto Alomar 0 and 1. And interesting there, Cal Ripken Jr., the shortstop was covering instead of the second baseman. You figure with a right-handed hitter up like Alomar that he might take the ball to right field if they try hit and run. So Cal Ripken Jr. was covering instead of his brother Billy. And uh, that's Cal's call to make. He right. Well, he's going to throw it to first base to try to pick him off. Doesn't work. Ballard does not have the reputation of a very good move particularly for a left hander. Well Joe Carter had a great jump. Bob Melvin just threw him out on his attempt. Nothing doing there. It's 0 and 2 to Alomar. I'm talking about Alomar being such a team player Joe. They had a recent ball game where they won in extra innings 2 to 1 and uh, Alomar he uh, hit a sacrifice to help set up a run early in the game, and then he hit a home run to win it. And they asked him about uh, his favorite bat of the game as he hits one in the left for a base hit in front of Segui. He said the sacrifice. He said, if I hadn't been able to get that done, the home run, I wouldn't even have had a chance to hit the home run the next innings to win it. That extends his hitting streak to 15 ball games. And last night, he had stolen four bases in the ball game he stole second and third twice and he had an opportunity to do it again in his next at bat but he was playing for the team and he let Joe Carter hit instead of him just stealing bases he felt that he could stay at first base give Carter a chance and he did so and they won the ball game so he is definitely a good team player and that's what I was saying that Cito Gaston talked about the guy will do whatever it takes for him to win. Joe Carter the hitter as Mark Williamson a right hander starts to warm up in the Orioles bullpen Elrod Hendricks number 44 the bullpen coach long time uh, big league catcher Here's pass here's Carter he's fouled to first and single to right two men on nobody out and that's a base hit here comes Devon White around third heading home and he'll score throw back to second and Adamar has been picked off. Bill Ripken with a tag. But a run has scored three to one Toronto. Just as I was about to talk about the speed and how they use it on the, the Toronto Blue Jays. Alomar makes a mistake. But there was no chance to get Devon White because of his speed. And coming up and firing to second base is Sagi. And you can see that Alomar is dead by a long way. Pretty heady play by Segui. Very heady play by Segui. He's not ordinarily. I mean, they wanted to become an outfielder. 
but he has very little experience out there. He's always been a first baseman in his career. Here's Tabler. Curve for a strike. Tabler has grounded out the fly now. But what Alomar was looking for was the Gee to throw the ball to the plate and miss the cutoff man so he could continue on around to third. But a very good play by Sagi. You see he's upset because he did make a mistake. But if you're an aggressive base runner and you play that way for 162 ball games, you will run into some mistakes. That's just the way it goes. One strike to Tabler. Down the left field line. Sagi on the run. And he's got it. Tabler falling a bit short. Aiming for that home run porch. Carter quickly beats a retreat to first. That's the second out. Big play for the Orioles because with these hitters coming up and Alomar just stayed in second base. They've got a chance for a real big inning here. But he was also, like as I say, trying to take the extra base if this Diego Segui, David Segui would have made a poor throw to the plate. So Diego Segui, very proud of his yeah. son. And uh, Sandy Alomar Sr., uh, understanding what Roberto was thinking of there. An understanding father. And Ed Sprague Sr. sitting out in Northern California as Ed Sprague Jr. comes to the plate. Cal Ripken Sr. sitting in the Baltimore dugout as his two sons play the middle infield. And that's foul down the right field line. Caught down there by somebody's son. I'm not sure who it is. What is today? Is today Father's Day or something? Seems like it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, next week is Father's oh, Day. Oh, next week. Okay. Yeah. But we're looking into all these father's sons out here today. Next Sunday on Father's Day, Joe, I have a Father's Day gift for you. Oh, okay. We're going to play in my area, so I don't have to travel. Of, you're like your home game. Yeah. You can have breakfast in bed. The twins can, you know, scramble you some eggs. <laughs> I had a Father's Day gift today. I played golf here in the area with some friends of mine. I don't get to play golf on the road. So I had a great time today. Such a life you lead. <laughs> Next week, Bobby Bonilla, Barry Bonds, and the Pirates, the best record of the majors right now, in San Francisco to take on the Giants. That's our Sunday night telecast, 8 o'clock Eastern next Sunday night. And, of course, Barry Bonds returning to the ballpark in which his father, Bobby Bonds, <laughs> performed so admirably for so many years. I might even talk my dad into going to that game, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> two two pitch foul the back and out of play. I promised the guys that I played golf with today I wouldn't tell anybody how bad I beat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness you uh, kept that promise. How badly did you beat him? Very bad. Oh, I thought yeah. so. Yeah. Well, it was bound to happen sooner or later. Yes. Two and two, the count, two down. Carter at first, and the Sprague takes inside. Three and two. You know, Terry Kennedy will be there next Sunday, and his father, Bob, will be there. So it's a lot of fathers and sons there next week, right? Bob Kennedy, a uh, former ball player years ago, manager, general manager. He's an executive with the Giants now, isn't he? Yes. Three and two the count. Let's see. Unfortunately, Buddy Bell has retired. And so has Gus, his father. Foul tip. Sprague still alive. This is the fifth man to bat in this inning. And Ballard has had the full counts four times. He's laboring for sure here in the sixth. The Blue Jays have another run on the board. Driven in by who else? Joe Carter, Mr. RBI, his 35th RBI of the year. There he is. Milligan playing behind him with a 3-2 count, two down. There he goes. That's foul. Fielded by Rich Hacker, used to be a coach with the St. Louis Cardinals, now here in Toronto, or with Toronto here in Baltimore. Three and two. Rich applauding our uh, efforts tonight on Sunday Night Baseball. Three and two to uh, Sprague. Sprague, a big uh, intercollegiate star at Stanford, as was Jeff Ballard. One Stanford star strikes out the other. The Blue Jays get just the one. Two hits, one left. 3-1 Toronto. 
Lever, three pickoffs in the same inning. You talk about some bad base running. <laughs> well, Cito Gaston was there that night, and he said well, Sakata was the catcher, and they watched it. And the, the equipment was too big for him. He bounced his throw about four times before he got to second base. They couldn't wait to run against him. His Orsalak bunts one, but foul. Well, Cliff Johnson had homered. They'd gone ahead. Then Sakata. Uh, with, as the catcher and Martinez then picked off three straight guys. In the bottom of the inning, Cal Ripken homered to tie the game, and then Sakata hit a three run homer to win it. Jim Palmer gave a scouting report on him after the game. He said, Len Sakata is a catcher. Terrible arm, doesn't handle pitchers well, hits with power. Orsalak has a bloop single to center. Well, we gave you that NBA score the Bulls defeating the Lakers and for those of you who have just joined us who are watching that here's what's been happening in this one back in the second Leo Gomez hit his first ever major league home run and the Orioles were out in front one to nothing against Todd Stottlemyre it remained that way until the fourth inning and that's when Devon White hit one 400 feet into the left field grandstand that tied the game his second home run of the year and then in the fifth inning this single by Manuel Lee Brought home Mark Witten, who had gotten himself into scoring position with some daring do in the base paths. Witten came around to score the go-ahead run to give Toronto a two-to-one advantage. They got another run of the sixth, which perhaps you saw after the basketball game driven in by Carter. Here is Cal Ripken. As the evening began, Cal Ripken, the leading hitter in the American League. But tonight he is fouled to the first baseman and hit a comebacker. 0 for 2. Orsalak at first, nobody out. Foul. And that's what Stottlemyre has done so well with Ripken tonight. He pitched him up and in to get the pop up and the ground out. Now he tries to come back inside and Ripken has made the adjustment and he gets the barrel out but too quickly. A hitter has to make adjustments to what the pitcher is doing to him. And you can watch the catcher this time. We'll see if they're setting up inside or going to go away. You have to go away after he pulls the ball foul but they're going back inside again. Look out. Well, that's okay. You go way inside. It's okay. <laughs> Two and one now. All right. Now what? Well, there was no doubt that Ripken was sitting on the ball inside. So if you come in there, it better be bad. And he comes inside, up and in. Now he's got him set up to go away. So pitching inside allows you to do a lot of things. Unconsciously, Ripken will probably open up a little quickly, and it'll give him a chance to go away with a breaking ball if he wants to. That's why he talked about pitching inside earlier in the broadcast. If you pitch inside, it keeps the hitter honest. It opens up a couple of avenues for you. The Blue Jays' bullpen is busy. Blue Jays ahead 3-1, to one, sixth inning. Popped him up, but foul and out of play. And he went with the breaking ball, but he did not get it away. Cal had a pitch to hit there. There's the bullpen. That's Willie Frazier on the left of your screen with the mustache. And on the right is the rookie, Mike Timlin. Real hard thrower. There's uh, Cito Gaston in the middle of the brain trust there. Gene Tennis to the right. Galen Cisco to his left. Rich Hacker also there with the piece of paper in his hand. And those coaches stick together. I'm not going with coaches anymore. I like brain trust, y'all. <laughs> well, they're going to go back inside again. Off the hands, and this one is playable. Handler back into Fairground. For the out. And again, he pitches Ripken perfectly. So you're giving the credit for shutting down Ripken to, to Stottlemyre. Yes, he's pitching very well. He's going inside and throwing enough breaking balls away just to keep him honest. But he's gotten him out all three times with a good fastball inside. And two of them have been up. By the way, uh, at the start of the day, Ripken leading the league in batting 359. He's now 0 for 3. Edgar Martinez of Seattle was second at 350, but he went 0 for 4 against Milwaukee today, although the Mariners defeated Milwaukee again. 6 to 1. Sam Horn pops it up. First ball swinging. This is Ed Sprague. Not number two. So Orsalak still at first. And the battle will be Leo Gomez. Every Oriole base runner in this game has gotten on base leading off an inning. The only man who's gotten past the base to which he got himself was Mike Devereaux. He walked in the first and went to second on a throwing error. 
by Stottlemyre, who made a wild pickoff throw. Gomez led off the second with a home run. But then in the third, Bill Ripken led off with a double, never got past second. Horn led off the fourth with a walk, stranded at first. Orsalak led off here in the sixth with a single. Now with two down, he's still at first. The batter, Leo Gomez. Three to one, Blue Jays, last of the sixth. The two runs by which Toronto leads this ball game, the Blue Jays getting a rallies going, taking an extra base, getting the clutch hit. Blue Jays have had two men bat with somebody in scoring position tonight, and each time the man got the base hit. The Orioles are 0 for 5. Is that right? Wow. 0 for 5 with men in scoring position. Goes inside to Gomez. Ball two. Well, he tried to pitch him inside the first couple of times up, and he got away with it the last time, but the time before that, he tried to go inside and got the ball out over the plate, and Gomez hit it into the bleachers. That's the risk you run of pitching inside. If you move the ball six inches out over the plate, you get hurt. And the breaking ball in for a strike. Two and one. So, in other words, if uh, see a pitcher who's not pitching inside chances are he's uh, not confident in his exactly. control or he's well he's not confident in his control you're throwing from 60 feet six inches and to hit a target you know three inches wide is pretty tough popped him up Roberto Alomar he wants it in front of Mark Witten and he's got it and Orsalak is stranded at first we're heading to the seventh inning. Witten borders and lead due up. The Blue Jays lead the Orioles three to one. Following the baseball game. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball is brought to you by Sterling, the remarkably equipped British road car, and by Ektar Film from Kodak. For advanced photographers, the genius is in the details. And now, Sunday Night Baseball continues with those Sunday Night Broadcasters, Joe Morgan and John Miller. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. There's ball one to Mark Whitten. <laughs> I like that guy. I don't know about have him you. on every Sunday. I don't know. <laughs> Whitten has hit a comebacker, and then he singled in the fifth. It looks so innocent. Ballard pitches. That's a base hit. He is two for three. But then he went the second on a one foot wild pitch. I mean the ball got not even probably one foot past Bob Melvin. But when he went the second that's the reason he was able to score a while later on a base hit by Manuel Lee. And here comes the manager John Oates out to the mound. He's got uh, Williamson up in the bullpen. It looks like he's going to uh, make the move here. So Ballard. Uh, will not be able to add to his win total his record three and six at the start of the night and uh, two years ago when he won 18 the ball club averaged nearly six runs a game of support in his behalf those were the salad days no longer here we'll be back Sunday night baseball from Baltimore it is Toronto three Baltimore one top of the seventh Mark Wilson on in relief of Jeff Ballard well, Williamson's Aaron run average of 4.41, not real good at this particular time. 22 strikeouts, 17 base on balls, not a good ratio, too many bases on balls. Williamson has been doing his best pitching of late. He has not allowed a run in his last six appearances. That borders the hitter, 0 for 2. And Whitten, as we saw, has a very good speed. He's the runner over at first. No. And he was out of the batter's box and he is out. The ball hit him after he had left the batter's box and he immediately was called out by Al Clark. The ball becomes dead at the moment he was hit and so the runner Witten will have to go back to first. The Barters is going to surprise everyone by getting a bunt down. Actually Gomez saw it right away and started in. He's clearly out of the batter's box when the ball does hit him on the right hip. So Borders is retired. I think it was a good idea. Could have gotten the other runner into scoring position. 
you now. Manuel Lee. Three to one Toronto ahead in the seventh inning. Manuel Lee batting left handed now. He is a switch hitter. Foul. Oh, and won the count. California Angels won today. Out of the West Coast. Seven to three. And this has been a bad day to be an East Coast baseball team. Every single Eastern Division club in the National League lost to every single club in the Western Division. Six Western teams defeated the six Eastern teams over there. And it's a foul by Manny Lee. And the only Eastern squad in the American League to win today was the New York Yankees, who came from behind with an exciting 6-4 to four victory over the Texas Rangers. They were trailing four to one as late as the seventh. And of course you've got the Orioles and Blue Jays here who are both in the East so one of them will win. Bad day back East. But uh, right now especially in the American League the West is looking very very strong. This Toronto club as Lee jumps back out of the way is a top the American League East if they were in the West right now. They would be in fifth place. But as Cito Gaston says, they're playing in the East. <laughs> That's all they're worried about right now. Trying to beat the other teams in the Eastern Division. And it used to be just the opposite. The East was the stronger division in the American League. Down and in, two and two. Kansas City Royals at 85 as Gaston flashes some signs. The Royals at 85, the Twins at 87. They did not have very good records, but they won it all. And they started by winning their division. And that's what you have to concentrate on the division. Then you worry about who your opponent will be in the playoffs. And back to the bag is Witt. One out. Witt did first, seventh inning here. Glenn Allen Hill is on deck. Dave Winfield in another home run today. What a year he has had. They get. Dave Parker to be as productive as he was last year. They will have a very fine ball club. Very good shot at open. Two and two the count to lead. We're at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. This is ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. And there's a look from uh, across 33rd Street at the old ballpark. Which will be decommissioned after the final game the first weekend of October. As the Orioles move downtown to the Camden Yards area. Two and two the count. That's foul and out of play. Williamson has an excellent fastball. And it looked like it has a lot of movement on it. Williamson out of San Diego State. One of his teammates when he played in college was Tony Gwynn. He probably couldn't get him out though. No one else can either. He didn't have to. <laughs> they played inter squad games. He couldn't get him out, especially with that aluminum bat. He struck him out. Good breaking ball. Williamson threw a lot of hard fastballs. Now he comes with a breaking ball. Good curveball down and in. Good spot. Williamson also throws a, an excellent uh, palm ball as a changeup. The curveball is something that uh, he's worked on over the years and has gotten better and better with it. He's always had a, a very good arm. They acquired him in the deal a few years ago in which uh, Storm Davis went out to San Diego and Terry Kennedy came here to Baltimore. Williams in the last couple of years has been one of the best set up men or middle relievers in the American League. Outside to Glenn Allen Hill, ball one. There's Jeff Ballard, six innings plus tonight. Hoping Williamson will have much success, give the Orioles a chance to come back. Williamson was eight and two last year, and ten and five the year before as a reliever. Low earned run average, set up man for Greg Olson. The count up, get it short over to brother Bill. The count gets the assist. Bill gets the put out. The Blue Jays are gone. Three to one, Toronto. The new ballpark down uh, in Camden Yards near the Inner Harbor in Baltimore and uh, we went down Joe and I with our little camera little camcorder and we 
made some videotape. There's the old warehouse that will be back, back beyond the right field wall. And there's the outside, and it will look uh, like a throwback to some of the old ballparks that fit in with the old architecture in that area, particularly that old uh, gigantic warehouse, about 150 years old, that warehouse is. Here is David Seguiz, grounded out and flight out. Matt Tabler takes it, and uh, Todd Stottlemyre is rolling right now. Great job. Call it Camden Yards. There's a, a little mini controversy here as to what to name this new ballpark. Babe Ruth, they discovered, used to frolic in what will be shallow center field. He was born a couple of blocks away, and they did an excavation of the area before they began the build, uh, building it discover one of his father's old taverns in what is shallow center field. Some people feel it should be called Babe Ruth Park. Others say, no, he was a Yankee. <laughs> Let's call it Camden Yards. You know, like, let's go to the yard. Randy Milligan with a ball and a strike now. He's 0 for 2. Joe, far be it for me to put you into the middle of a controversy. Please. But, uh, what, what do you favor? Please. <laughs> I don't live here. I'm not going to pay any taxes to get the stadium done. You probably go for like Johnny Bench Park or something. No, but I, you know what? I, I think it is a great thought. In the past, we used to call the baseball park the yard and Camden Yards. If you're trying to build a stadium that's kind of a throwback type of stadium, that's a pretty interesting name. Well, Fenway Park, as a for instance, was named after the area in which it was located, the Fenway area in the back bay of Boston. I heard where Roger Angel, the, uh, the outstanding baseball essayist of the New Yorker, he loves Camden Yards. The idea of let's go to the yard. Ball four to Milligan. So he's aboard for the one out. Todd Stottlemyre, he's not going it alone tonight. There's his uh, lovely wife, Sherry. And uh, there is his mother, Jean Stottlemyer, the wife of Mel Stottlemyre, the man who started this whole Stottlemyre Major League Dynasty. They're starting to worry a little bit, though. I could see that on the mother's face. Well, maybe we should go to the replay, Joe, and have you uh, use the telestrator <laughs> on that. Maybe. <laughs> Joe is a, an analyst in every sense of the word. How am I looking to you? Am I looking a little worried right now? A little stressful, maybe? Here's Bob Melvin. He's grounded a second and he's struck out. Both bullpens are busy right now. One out, one on, seven inning. Toronto ahead three to one. There's a call strike to Melvin. The Orioles are hopeful they'll be able to get Glenn Davis back. He suffered uh, an injury to the spinal accessory nerve. Melvin with a foul that goes back out of play. Strike two. There is Dwayne Ward, the big, hard-throwing right-hander in the Toronto bullpen. Bob Melvin for the count of 0 and 2. And uh, Davis lost strength in his right shoulder. He's unable to throw the ball. He struck out Melvin. Second straight time. Melvin is 0 for 3. Two down. Bill Ripken coming up. Well, they're finally getting some positive information about Davis. We take another look at that uh, strike three to Melvin and uh, Davis if the doctors given the clearance as early as Tuesday could come out here to the ballpark and not face live pitching it but face the underhand toss just to get try and get the feel back for it and if all goes well who knows they, that's the problem with the injury John Oates described it he said hey if he'd broken a leg or broken his arm you put it in a cast it heals and you put it back out there. But this, the, the traction of the spinal accessory nerve, it is so rare, they don't know if it'll be back in two weeks, three weeks, ten months. They're, they're hoping earlier rather than, than later. Ball on a strike to Bill Ripken. He's doubled and struck out. Here's John Oates. third baseman leading the shortstop give chase but it's well back in amongst the spectators and there are 27,783 of them here tonight at the old uh, at the old yard 
Memorial Stadium. They've played sports on this site since 1922. There was an old ballpark called the Municipal Stadium built here. That was kind of jury rigged into a baseball stadium in the old minor league ballpark. Orioles Park burned down in the 40s. And then while they were still playing international league baseball here, they began constructing around the ball games this ballpark. Oh. ball to second to Alomar. Easy play. And Stottlemyer is making it look easy. He and the Blue Jays lead the Orioles after seven, three to one. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball is brought to you by Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. By the good tires, good service, and good people at your nearby Goodyear retailer. By Minwax Wood Finishes. With Minwax, it's easy to make wood beautiful. And by State Farm Insurance. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And uh, this is Sunday Night Baseball from Baltimore. Three to one, the Blue Jays lead the Orioles. This is John Miller along with Joe Morgan, your Sunday night baseball telecasters. Devon White is lined to second. He's hit a home run to left and he has walked and scored a run. Now he's batting left handed against Williamson who throws him a fastball for a strike on one. Williamson in relief of uh, Ballard who went six innings plus gave up three runs seven hits. And now Williamson trying to keep it close working from the stretch. Curveball in there for a called strike two. Devon White has hit two home runs this year, and both of them have come from the right side. As we mentioned, he was hitting 333 coming into the game from the right side. Foul ball. Toronto Blue Jays. I mean, year in, year out. Go back as far back as 1983. This club is always in the pennant race. Many years uh, predicted uh, by most to be the best team to win the division. And the foul tip is held by Melvin. Strike three. Hitters stand in different spots in the batting box, batter's box, for different reasons. Look at Roberto Alomar. When he stands up close, so everything he hits will be in fair territory because his bat will be working out in fair territory in front of the plate. We'll get an example here. Watch. See, he's right out in front of the plate. That keeps the ball fair. Now, guys that stand deep in the batter's box have just the opposite effect. Their bat does not stay fair in fair territory very long. So you stand in the front part of the batter's box. That's the way I used to like to stand because it kept my bat in fair territory throughout the swing. Here's an example of Joe Carter. He's deep in the box. Now he will have his bat will not be in fair territory when he swings. He will work out in front right there. See how the ball goes foul right down the line. Williamson throws out Alomar out number two. Well, why would a guy stand deep in the box like that? Well, when you stand deep in the box, theoretically, it gives you a longer look at the pitch. It gives you a split second longer to see the pitch and recognize it. But it also gives the, the, the uh, pitcher a little more of the outside part of the plate to work with because it gives the ball a little more time to break away from you. And when you stand in front of the batter's box, you have to be able to handle the fastball because it gets there a little quicker. So usually guys with quick bats will stand in front. Guys with a little slower bats or guys who want to see the ball a little longer will stand deeper in the box. So you would always stand in the front. I always stood in the front because I wanted my bat to be in fair territory at all times. Whenever I swung the bat, I was in if it was in fair territory. Even when you faced Koufax or yeah, Nolan Ryan, guys like that, you'd stand up in the front. Yeah, I wasn't real smart, but I did it anyway. <laughs> Here's Joe Carter. He's fouled out twice. He's single. He has an RBI. Takes a strike from Mark Williamson. 0 and 1. Carter only two hits in 15 lifetime at bats against Williams and there he is deep in the box for Williams he, he just picks a spot and he stays with it yes right to Gomez at third and the inning is over Williamson has come on retired all six of the hitters he has faced 
done his job. Kept uh, Baltimore close. Top of the order for the Orioles. They need two good. We're bringing right it. Hander on the pitch for Toronto. Well, Dwayne Ward and Tom Hinkie, two real hard throwing right handers, are back to back in the Toronto bullpen for the Toronto Blue Jays. Look, there's a great 39 strikeouts and 11 bases on balls. And there's Stottlemyre. He's relaxing in the dugout. And uh, as well he might, it's the heck of a game. Gives, a, gives the ball to Dwayne Ward. This guy, when Hanky was on the disabled list earlier this year, became the closer. And he was certainly up to it as Devereaux takes a fastball for a strike. By the time Hanky got back, Ward was right up at the top of the league in saves. He has 12 saves. Devereaux 0 for 2 of the walk, hitting 287. And uh, quickly the count is 0 and 2. Ward, the real hard thrower, and he's got uh, a split fingered fastball that can be devastating. Well, Joe, in a way, this ball game for Toronto is sort of a, a blueprint kind of a game. This is the kind of a game that they're built to play. Defense, a little bit of speed, some clutch hitting, strong pitching. And well Lee throws out Devereaux one away. Well they've definitely taken advantage of every scoring opportunity they've had tonight. They're two for two with the runners in scoring position. And they've also hit the home run. So they're doing a good job and you're mentioning they they're built to play low run ball games. Not as many home run hitters as they had the last couple of years. Here is Joe Orsalak. Orsalak has popped a third, popped a short, and singled one for three. Blue Jays have played 56 games before tonight. And 29 of them, or a little bit more than half, have been decided by one run or two runs. So they've played a lot of uh, tight ones. Orsalak. One for three. He is two for two with four walks in his career against Ward. Straight back at Ward, just as he was with Devereaux, is ahead of Orsalak. 0 and 2. 3 to 1. Toronto ahead, last of the eighth. Cal Ripken on deck. Orsalak might get aboard for the big hitter to try and tie it. He struck him out. It might have been that split fingered fastball. Well, you mentioned the good split finger, and he threw him two good fastballs, came back with the split finger. Here's Cal Ripken. And there's Cal Ripken's home run chart for 1991. All but one going to left center and over. And one in the right center field. But tonight, Cal has fouled the first. He's hit a comebacker and he's popped the first. See if they stay inside. They pitched him inside the entire ball game. Stottlemyre did and was very successful. See if Ward stays inside or goes away. He's going away. Strike one. Three one Blue Jays. And a victory for Toronto will give them an, an extra game in the standings. Boston, the second place team, lost today. In fact, Toronto would gain on the whole division except the Yankees. Everybody lost in the division except New York. Here's the one strike pitch to Cal. Shows bunt. Takes strike two. He has had three bunt singles this year. That's eight pitches thrown by Ward. They have all been strikes. There is uh, some activity going in the bullpen. Acker's been uh, starting of late. And McDonald, the left hander, I don't think they're going to be in this ball game, though. There's the ball. One and two. One of the reasons it is so tough to hit, the first pitcher. Stottlemyre just stayed inside inside on Cal Ripken. Now you start to think I've got to be quick. I've got to be quick. Dwayne Ward throws him breaking ball away and then a fastball on the outside corner. He stayed away from it. That's a breaking ball. One hopper to Sprague. That is the inning. Well the Blue Jays have just shut down the Orioles. Three hits and just one run. We go to the ninth. Three to one Blue Jays. Center right after the ball game. Mark Williamson to Pat Tabler. Ninth inning here, three to one, Toronto ahead. There's a strike. By the way, Nicholas on uh, Sports Center after the ball game. That reminds us that this Thursday and Friday on ESPN, you'll be able to see uh, the U.S. Open, the premier golfing event in the United States. That's Thursday and Friday. All the greatest golfers will be there, and there's your chance to be there too. Join ESPN Thursday and Friday for live first and second round coverage of the U.S. Open. 11 a.m. Thursday morning, also 5 p.m. 
and Friday the same times 11 a.m. and at 5 p.m. There's a two hour version of the day's coverage uh, each night at 730. Mark Williamson to Pat Tatler who is 0 for 3. Just off the outside one and two the count. And now Williamson uh, showing tonight why he's been one of the top what would you call a middleman or setup man. Uh, he's been the guy usually in the last couple of years. There's a base hit. Gave him the kiss of death. Base hit for Tabler. Been the setup man the last couple of years for Olsen out there. Oh, that was a good pitch by Williamson. He just got it up a little bit, but it was on the hands, and he jammed ta Tabler, but he was able to push it into left field for a base hit. It's a fastball in, and he jams Tabler, but Tabler is able to get it into left field. So here's the young Ed Sprague. He's only 23 years of age, born in Castro Valley, California. <laughs> the ball is fouled straight back the hit and run was on and each time Rip Cal Ripken Jr. has made the right selection of by not letting Billy Ripken cover on these hit and runs he's covered on each one and both times the hitters have tried to go to the right side and Cal Ripken Jr. of course makes all those calls because he is the veteran of the infield. The Orioles with bullpen activity. There's Tabler at first, milling it on the bag with him. Nothing going this time as the ball is lofted foul on the right field line into the mezzanine section. 0 oh, and 2 the count. You talk about Ed Sprague Sr. He used to own a minor league baseball team in uh, Stockton. Stockton, the Stockton yes. Ports. Right. In the California League. He and his uh, wife, this fellow's mother, had, they ran the club, right? Had his and her ball club teams, but it was. Actually, that wasn't his mother. <laughs> that was his stepmother. His stepmother. Oh, and two, the count to Sprague. And one and two. Cal Ripken. Makes all the uh, the signals out there. And he, that means me. That means he's covering. So another base hit. Tabler, who singled the left, followed by Sprague, who singles to right. It's the first hit for each of them, and the batter will be Mark Whitten. And we're going to get a pinch runner at first base. Rene Gonzalez, who is the defensive. Specialist will go in to run for Sprague and then he'll take over at third base. Mike Squire is the first base coach over there with him. So Sprague finishes one for four. Rene Gonzalez, former Oriole. They still remember. Very popular guy here for a guy who didn't play much. Talk about a career move that didn't work out. His best position is shortstop. Yes. And he played here with the Orioles. <laughs> Wasn't much work for him. Cal Ripken not only plays every day, he plays uh, virtually every inning every day. Mark Whitten, two for three in the game. Two on, nobody out. The Orioles uh, third baseman uh, Gomez shortened up. Foul to the seats off to the right. In the bullpen, there's the veteran left-hander Mike Flanagan. Spent the last uh, three seasons or so with Toronto, and all of the years before that, and now you're in Baltimore with the Orioles. Talking about Cal Ripken, and there's a Cal Senior talking with John Oates. John Oates is uh, a guy who came up in the Orioles system. He says Cal Senior taught him the game. Everything he knows about the game, he learned from Cal Senior. And there are a lot of Oreo players over the years who will say the same thing. Just off the outside. One ball, one strike. Blue Jays threatening to uh, break it open now. They lead already three to one. We're in the ninth. The Orioles offense tonight has consisted of a Leo Gomez homer and nothing since. 
have only three hits for the game. One and one to Witten. Tabler at second, Gonzalez at first. And the uh, palm ball, the changeout, swung out and missed. There is Tabler. And Gonzalez at first. Gonzalez wears number 88 because he wanted number eight when he got here. And they said, well, that's taken. And uh, he said, he said jokingly, he said, well, uh, then 88. And when he got here for opening day, there it was, 88. Still wears it now with the Blue Jays. He struck him out. Third strikeout for Williamson. Williamson fools Witten with his breaking ball. It actually looks like a palm ball. You can see his hand open up and the off-speed pitch. Fools him. He's way out in front. Sports Center follows the game. Stay tuned to all of the day's highlights and uh, a lot of uh, wild things went on in baseball today. And some interesting things. Oral Hirschheiser is back from the disabled list, and today he pitched a beauty at Wrigley Field. Pat Borders the hitter. A check swing. And on appeal, ruled a swing by Larry Barnett. One strike the count to Borders, who is 0 for 3. It's a hard breaking ball away, and Barters tries to check his swing. Went too far. Larry Barnett punches him out. Well, he punches a strike on him anyway. Is they teach it that way in umpire school, you think? That's where the term punch out came from anyway. <laughs> Larry Barnett, Barnett was the umpire in the famous 1975 World Series when Ed Ombrist abundant the ball out in front of the plate and Carlton Fisk claimed he was interfered with which he was not and Larry Burnett ruled correctly and the Reds won the world championship. And correct it's one ruling, and one correct ruling by Larry Barnett. He You're said he got a lot of bad letters probably from New Englanders about that call but you don't actually, see me arguing. But actually, when they showed it again on replay in slow motion, you could see that Ed Armbrister clearly, clearly tried to get out of the way. You don't see me arguing. I'm not from New England. <laughs> There's ball two outside. But Larry Burnett's been a good umpire for a long time. Pat Borders with a count of two and one. Tabler at second, Sprague at first. 3 1 Toronto in the ninth. Steps off the rubber. Two balls, one strike. On deck, Manuel Lee. Is uh, Manuel? Strike two on the outside. Two and two the count. Frank Robinson, I think, is uh, supposed to be back here in Baltimore to begin his duties as assistant general manager uh, soon. Tomorrow. That's Starts on June 10th. That's, that's tomorrow, all right. He's been out in uh, Southern California at his home uh, since being reassigned <laughs> <laughs> or fired. That's a foul. Two and two the count. But uh, it's interesting. I mean, doesn't happen that many times outside of, uh, say, when George Steinbrenner owned the Yankees. The guys would be fired and uh, definitely be reassigned. Then they'd be back a few months later or the next year. I mean, well, you wonder if it'd be a little difficult for Frank. He comes back. These are the guys who, in effect, fired him or reassigned him, whatever. Well, Frank's a very good baseball man, and he will do a good job in evaluating the talent for him. That's a foul. And evaluating opposing players so they can make proper trades. So... I think it's a very smart move to bring in a guy who had just seen all of the other players in the leagues. In both leagues, he sees the National League in spring training, and he sees the American League, of course, on a daily basis. So Frank's a guy that knows the game inside and out. So his knowledge can, can do nothing but help the Orioles organization. Well, one thing, of course, he had this job when they made him manager when they uh, fired Cal Ripken. 
Shallow right. Also like with that slide, and he got it. Nice play. A sprawling, sliding catch by Orsolak, and that wakes this crowd up. That's the kind of outfield defense the Orioles played two years ago when they were in the pennant race. They had probably some of the greatest plays ever made collectively by their outfielders during the season. Orsolak charges it, leaves his feet right there, and makes the catch. And Larry Barnett ran out to right field to make sure he made the catch and he gave the call. And clearly you can see the ball go into his glove. Nice catch by Orsola. How would you describe that particular method of, uh, I mean, he didn't make the headlong dive. He didn't actually slide the way we saw Sagi earlier. Sort of a sideways sliding dive, I guess. That's uh, ball one. You're the play-by-play -play guy. I'm the analyst. <laughs> you call it. <laughs> <laughs> I need help on this one, Joe. <laughs> Whatever, it was a great play. Manuel, Lee. well, it's television. They saw it. The heck with the description. <laughs> a lovely play by Orsola, the right fielder. Manuel Lee has lined to right. He single home a run that he has struck out. One for three. Two on, two out. Right to Bill Ripken, and the side is retired. So Williamson. Three innings of shutout pitching got out of a jam here. Last chance for the Orioles, and we'll be back. Sports Center right after the ball game, the NBA Finals. And it's uh, starting to look final right now. Looks tough for the Lakers. Yeah. All of that coming up right after the ball game. Here, the score is 3 to 1. The Blue Jays lead the Orioles. And the Orioles are looking for a little. Uh, Late night thunder. There is the former Oriole, Rene Gonzalez, talking it over with Cal Ripken Sr. He is now playing third base, is uh, Rene. And Tom Hankey, the Terminator, the closer in the Toronto bullpen. He's up. He'll be ready if Ward uh, should falter here in the ninth. Todd Stottlemyre, who had uh, gone three straight starts without getting a victory. But he is the pitcher of record in this one. And now Dwayne Ward will face Sam Horn. Horn last night in the ninth inning hit a two run homer against Hankey. Down the right field line, that's a fair ball. Should be just a single, though. With that angled wall in the corner, balls that are doubles in just about anywhere else are often singles here. Single for Horn. Well, Horn hits the ball awfully hard down the right field line, and it bounces off the wall so quickly, he does not have a chance to go for two. The fastball out over the plate, and he really turns on it well. Nice play by Whitten in right field to hold him to a single. And uh, Sam Horn retires for the evening, got the job done, and there is Tito Bell. He's given name of Juan Bell. He's talking with Coach Kurt Moten there. He's the younger brother of the former Blue Jay, George Bell. But down in the Dominican, everybody refers to him as Tito. And he's a very fast runner. The batter, Leo Gomez. The possible tying run of the game. Strike on the inside, 0-1. Gomez has homered tonight. His first major league home run, that was in the second. He is flying to shallow right, and he has popped to second. He hit 26 home runs in Triple A ball last year with 97 RBIs at Rochester. And quickly, two strikes. Well, they've tied him up inside when they've been able to get the ball inside. The home run he hit was on a mistake that was out over the plate a little bit. But Hinky follows suit. That the same suit that Stottlemyre tried. Ward. I should say fires inside as Stottlemyre did. There's Bell at first. Gomez asking for time. Tabler on the bag with Bell. Ward has thrown 13 pitches in this game, and 12 of them have been strikes. In fact, he has had an 0-2 count to every batter he has faced, except for Horn. There's John Oates 
on the on the phone telling his wife that he's might be a little late if they go extra innings. Maybe he's calling the bullpen. I could be. Just off the outside. That was a very good, smart pitch by Ward. He had thrown a couple of fastballs inside, and he tried to hit the outside corner. David Segui is on deck. A switch hitter. And Randy Milligan. Three to one, Toronto ahead, last of the night. One ball, two strikes to Gomez. He came back with it again and again. He missed. Well, with a two and two count, he will probably come back inside again with a fastball. Is Gomez, is he too close to the plate to handle those pitches? Well, he's not handling them. A lot of guys, it doesn't matter where they stand, their bat is slow inside. Here's the 2 2 pitch on the way. Broken bat pop up. Tabler in foul ground takes it. And a good pitch by Ward. He went right back inside and shatters his bat. A lot of guys, they need the extension, the ball out over the plate, and that lets them have a quick bat. You come inside and it ties your bat, bat speed up. See how he shortens his arm to get to the ball. So an excellent pitch by Ward. He set him up perfectly for that pitch. Well, John Oates at this point hoping for some production. It's three to one Toronto. Last of the night here's David Segui. He's grounded to the pitcher, flagged to shallow left and grounded to first. 0 for three. In the ninth inning the other day at Minnesota, he hit a home run against Rick Aguilera, his only home run of the year. Three to one Toronto Sports Center right after the ball game next Sunday night. We will greet you at 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Pacific, from San Francisco, the first place Pittsburgh Pirates, Bonds and Bonilla and Company, and the San Francisco Giants. And a ball gets past borders. And Bell goes to second, turns the corner, and holds. Wild pitch is the scorekeeper's ruling. Well, a base hit can mean a run. That's not of any concern to the Orioles, really, except it takes them out of the double play situation. It doesn't really help them a lot. The fastball way inside, and Borders could not keep it in front of him. But the only thing that it eliminates is the double play. It doesn't. The runner at the plate is the tying run. That doesn't change. Still got to get two. You still have to get two runs. And the split fingered fastball, he just got a piece of it. The count is one and two. But on a 1 1 pitch, he made him swing as if it was two strikes. Well, he was completely fooled by the pitch. It looked like a fastball until it got to the plate and just started to dive straight down. Very good pitch by Ward. Ward has excellent stuff on his fastball and his split finger. And he has good location. So he fooled him so badly to come right back with that one. But pitchers sometimes outsmart themselves saying, well, he's looking for it, so I'll go with a fastball. One ball, two strikes to count. One out, one on. Fastball. Manuel Lee throws him out. See, I told you pitchers sometimes do that. <laughs> That's why it's tough to hit. A lot of pitchers do not have a pattern. You would think that he would come back with a split finger because he made him look so bad, so badly on the play, but he comes back with a fastball and he jams him. The pitcher trying to reverse his feel can't do so. Nice play by Manuel Lee. Manuel throws the first. Easy out. Randy Milligan. Foul ball, strike one. Milligan is flying to right, struck out and walked. Last year he was the big gun for the Orioles. Cal Ripken struggled early in the season before he got it going. Milligan, in two thirds of the season before he hurt his shoulder. Had 20 homers last year. He's uh, struggled early this year. Swing to the best strike, too. So 
the Orioles have one strike of life left to them. And the Blue Jays are one strike away from uh, gaining a game over the Red Sox in the standings. By the way, we want to say hello to everyone uh, looking in tonight via the Sports Network of Canada. Glad to have you with us tonight on our Sunday night telecast. The pinch taken for a ball. It didn't miss by much. There is Ernie Witt, the longtime Blue Jay, now with the Orioles. And if Milligan can get aboard somehow, Witt would take a shot at his former mates. One and two, the count, two down, runner at second. Up the middle, and through for a base hit. Rounding third is Bell, he'll score easily. And Ernie Witt will get that shot, and it's three to two, Toronto. Milligan just did make it through with the RBI. And the fans shout Moose. That's his nickname, Moose Milligan. As Dottlemeyer, he's saying that he's been snake bit his last three or four starts. Now sees that this win is in jeopardy. It's a fastball inside. Grounded back through the middle. Ward almost barehands it. And then I think he decides better against it. And the ball goes on into center field. Manuel will try to get it. He tries to dive for it to keep it on the infield and try to keep the run from scoring. And there's Ward. He's saying I should have grabbed it with my glove hand and not my bare hand. So here's the longtime Blue Jay. He was an original when the Blue Jays were born in 1977. Ernie Witt, two down runner at first. Too high. Witt now with the Orioles. He's a pinch hitter, sometimes catcher. They like his experience. They like his left-handed bat. And he is hitting 286 as a pinch hitter. Ward knows exactly what he wants to do. They know exactly where they want to pitch with. They want to try and stay up on him. They don't want to throw him any low fastballs if they can help it. He's a good low fastball hitter. That's a strike on the inside. Interesting infield defense for the Blue Jays. Gonzalez at third is right on the line guarding against the extra base hit. But uh, there you see it. Manuel Lee up the middle and Roberto Alomar is in the short outfield. Holes all over this infield. One and one to it. Three to two the score. Well that was low but too low. Well, that's not exactly where they want to pitch him either. They want to stay above the belt. With Witt. Ernie Witt. He uh, had a chance last night and walked as a pinch hitter against Hankey. That's the only time he's ever faced the Blue Jays until now. Three and one. He's batting for Bob Melvin, the catcher. Bill Ripken is uh, on deck. They still have uh, Dwight Evans, among others, on their bench. The fastball again, way inside. They're trying to stay inside on him, but too far inside. Witt also likes the ball out over the plate so he can extend his arm. Milligan at first, ready to go on anything. Two down in the ninth. Three and one to where he wins. And he walks it. And so the possible tying run has been moved into scoring position. Henke is ready in the bullpen, and Cito Gaston is ready to go get him. He's already called for him. So we will see Tom Henke. And Henke has been five for five at his last five attempts. He's actually seven for seven for the year. He had a couple before he went on the DL, and since he's been off the DL, he's perfect five for five, and that's Johnny Oates. And Dwight Evans. Looking over his roster to decide who he wants to hit against Tom Hinky. Dwight Evans, uh, perhaps, when we come back. So in the last of the ninth, two men on, two men out, and uh, John Oates has a decision to make. The ninth place hitter, Bill Ripken, is due up. But Joe, we got a copy of uh, John Oates' notes that he keeps with him, that he makes before a game to remind himself. And against Henke, here's what he does. He's got a yes list and a no list. Well, Milligan and Segui are the guys he wants against him. 
Hewlett, Evans, he doesn't want him to use, but he's going to have to come out with Dwight Evans. And you hear the crowd react. In a short time, this longtime Red Sox hero has become a favorite here in Baltimore as well. The 39-year-old Dwight Evans will come to bat against a real tough right-hander, Tom Hankey. Well, the reason he doesn't want Evans to hit against Hankey is because he's 0 for 8 lifetime against him with three strikeouts. So that's what he's thinking about when he makes up those notes. He does not want to match Evans up against him unless he has to. And right now he has to. But because he's 0 for 8 does not mean he cannot get a base hit. 0 for 8, 8 at bats to me does not ever constitute a real pattern for a hitter and a pitcher unless he is struck out like 8 straight times or 7 out of 8, something like that. Now, three strikeouts in the eight. Yeah, but that's not enough. You usually have to get about 20 to 25 at bats before you know whether a guy can really handle a pitcher or not, and vice versa. So here's Dwight Evans. I remember a game that you and I did last 4th of July at the Metrodome. And you see Milligan at second. He's the possible tying run. Win at first, the possible winning run. And in the ninth inning against the closer, Rick Aguilera, when Evans was still with Boston, Red Sox trailing. He hit a three-run homer to win that game for Boston. He's had some big clutch hits over the years. And he is a good fastball hitter. Two men on, two men out in the ninth inning. Three to two, Toronto. Ball on in the inside. Evans is hitting 371 with men in scoring position. Consistent with his record the last 10, 11 years, he's been a great man in the clutch. But so too is Tom Hankey. Pop up. Alomar is there, and the ball game is over. And the Blue Jays hold on to win it by one, three to two, and for Hankey, his eighth save in eight tries. Well, I thought the Toronto Blue Jays showed why they're leading the league right now, the division, because their pitching staff made a lot of quality pitches. One mistake to Gomez, but other than that, they got the fastball where they wanted. They got the breaking balls in good position. They showed me something tonight. So there are the game totals. The Blue Jays are a winner, and they are now a game and a half up on Boston in the East. Coming up Wednesday, 7.30 Eastern, Wednesday night baseball. The Pittsburgh Pirates first in the East and the Los Angeles Dodgers first in the West. Bonds and Bonilla, Samuel and Murray. That'll be Wednesday at 7.30. Next Sunday, we'll be in San Francisco with those same Pirates and the Giants. Sports Center is coming up next. Stay tuned for that. Now, this is John Miller for Joe Morgan. Thanking you for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the telecast. The final again, Toronto 3 and the Orioles 2. Now, from Baltimore, good night, everyone.